Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 2021 seminar towards an Atlantic vision for maritime spatial planning, MSP. My name is Karen Coleman. I'm a journalist and broadcaster from Ireland, and I have the pleasure of being the moderator of today's seminar. So this webinar is hosted jointly by the European MSP platform, the Assistance Mechanism for the Action Atlantic Action Plan and the SIM Atlantic Project. And it is part of the European Maritime Day in My Country program. So the objective of today's event is to briefly present you with progress on the SIM Atlantic and the Atlantic Action Plan projects. It will also help to gather ideas and to hear what lessons can be learned to help develop a vision for maritime spatial planning in the European Atlantic region. Before we begin, I just want to go through a couple of housekeeping issues with you. By default, for those of you who are attendees and not speakers, as this is a webinar, your cameras and microphones will be off throughout the duration of the webinar. We are going to have question and answer segments during the sessions, and we would really like to take your questions. So if you would like to submit a question, can you please use the dedicated Q&A box to ask questions? And by the way, we won't be working with raised hands. If you do have technical problems, can you please use the chat box? A member of the technical team will be monitoring the chat box all the time, and indeed the Q&A as well. Now, can I also ask you to please remain connected at the end of the webinar until the host closes the session, as you will be directed to a dedicated survey where we would like to hear your ideas on the vision for the Atlantic. So now let's look and see what's ahead of us over the next couple of hours. Serge, who's going to be working the slides behind the scenes, has access to the slides. So now let's have a look, Serge, at the agenda slides for the day. So as you can see, we're first going to hear very shortly from Felix Lenneman, and then we're going to have our first session, which is on the European Atlantic region. We will have three people speaking on that. Session two will tackle transboundary issues, and we will have three speakers on that. And then, Serge, if you go to the next slide, we'll see what we have for the rest of the morning. So there'll be a quick break at 11.20 for about 10 minutes, and then we'll do our final session, which is developing a vision for MSP, and then finally we will have a conclusion. So as you can see, we have a packed program. Let's get going. And now to kick things off, I'd like to invite onto our virtual stage, Felix Lenneman, Head of Unit for Blue Economy Sectors, Aquaculture and Maritime Spatial Planning with DG Mari, Directorate General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries at the European Commission. Felix, very good morning to you and over to you. Yes. Good morning. Good morning, Karen, and good morning, everyone. It uh, would actually be nice to see many familiar faces here and meet in person. I have fond memories of the closing conference of the SimCell project in Liverpool three years ago. But today it's virtual. Um, but nevertheless, it's bringing people across and along the European Atlantic facade together. You may enjoy some noise from the workers next door as well. So I'm bringing you to my house here, here in Brussels and greetings to everyone. Um, it's very good to see three EMFF, European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, funded projects working together. Um, and it's a very timely event that you are having. It's the week of European Maritime Day uh, on the 20th and 21st of May, which will also take place mostly virtual. And um, as Karen already mentioned, the part is the, your event is now part of the EMD in my country events, which is also very nice to see. And speaking about good timing, I uh, think I should say a few words about uh, what happened yesterday. The European Commission adopted its new approach to a sustainable blue economy, updating the concept of blue growth, which dated from 2012 already, and adapting it to the objectives of the European Green Deal. Decarbonization and creating more biodiversity, making Europe the first carbon neutral uh, continent by uh, 2050. And the strategy focuses on six points. First, the development of offshore renewable energy, decarbonizing maritime transport and greening ports, a sustainable ocean energy mix that would include fixed and floating offshore wind, 
wave and tidal energy could generate more than a quarter of the EU's electricity in 2050. Second, the switch to a circular economy and the reduction of pollution. Third, preserving biodiversity and investing in nature. This includes protecting 30% of the EU seas area to reverse biodiversity loss, increase fish stocks, contribute to climate mitigation and resilience, and generate significant financial and social benefits. The fourth focus will be to reduce um, the environmental impact of fishing on marine habitats and to support for climate adaptation and coastal resilience by developing green infrastructure in coastal areas. It will be important to protect coastlines from the risk of erosion and flooding and to help preserve biodiversity and landscapes, while this all can also benefit to tourism and the coastal economy. Um, last but not least, or fifth, first of all, the strategy will aim at ensuring sustainable food production including the sustainable production of and new marketing standards for seafood, the use of algae and sea grass, stronger fisheries control, as well as research and innovation, if we look at so-called cell-based seafood. And finally, and here we come to our event today, that this strategy will focus on improving the management of space at sea. The Commission has announced the creation of a blue forum for users of the sea, which will coordinate a dialogue between offshore operators, stakeholders and scientists engaged in fisheries, aquaculture, shipping, tourism, renewable energy and other activities. As maritime spatial planners or people working along these planners, you are very much in advance on these things and you know what we are talking about. But many other players are only starting to realize what dimension of change for our sea space this will mean in the coming years. I probably don't need to mention the updated Atlantic Action Plan. Um, you will be familiar with that also as the assistance mechanism is a, is a co-organizer. Um, but if I look at the four pillars, Atlantic ports as gateways and hubs for the blue economy, marine renewable energy, blue skills, and ocean literacy and healthy ocean and resilient coasts, MSP will be an essential tool to implement at least three or even four of those pillars. If I think about ocean literacy, maritime spatial planning can do a lot about that. Um, so there in the Atlantic, member states may have more space at sea than in other sea basins, but that doesn't necessarily mean that planning is easier. So I'm great to see, I'm happy to see that you will also have input from the Baltic to see how things are going in other sea basins. Um, and um, I look forward to all the rest of the discussions and the presentations. I wish you fruitful discussions during the day. And with that, I hand over back to Karen. Thank you. And all Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix. Thank you very much for that. And the points you raised, I'm sure, will be touched on as well by some of our speakers throughout the next couple of hours. Well, now it's time for our first panel session. And the theme of this first session is the European Atlantic region. The aim of this session is to briefly present the geographic context of the European Atlantic region and the status of MSP in the European Atlantic nations. So we're going to hear from three speakers during this session. They will each deliver a short presentation. And then time permitting, I will moderate a brief question and answer session once they've made their presentations. So please do submit any questions you may want to put to the speakers through the Q&A box. Um, before I start, can I ask our speakers to please remember to stick to your allotted time in your presentation. Don't forget to activate your microphones and your cameras when you're making your presentation. So now let's go to our first speaker. Julian DeLasser is an MSP project manager at Surima. He's already participated in the Simnarat project, and Julian's talk will be introducing the European Atlantic region. Julian, over to you. Well, good morning, Karen, and good morning, everyone, and thanks for this uh, introduction. Um, so I'm Julian Dilasser from Surma, and um, as a brief introduction for the rest of the presentation uh, this morning, we, we will now continue with a quick presentation from the, some characteristic of the Atlantic coast and the same Atlantic studies area. So um, to do this, I will uh, base my presentation on the state of the art that we produced at the beginning of the project. Uh, it's an inventory of the physical characteristic of, of the region. And then uh, I will hand uh, with the studies that we are currently developing 
on the future trends in the activity sector. So first, the Sim Atlantic project area correspond to uh, OSPAR region three on four. Uh, the OSPAR three uh, encompasses the Celtic Seas between the island of Great Britain on the northwest coast of France. And the OSPAR four includes the Bay of Biscay on the Iberian coast region. So the project uh, encompassed uh, the coastal and the offshore waters, including uh, territorial seas, exclusive economic zone, and the continental shield. So, uh, among other information, information um, the report underlined that the bathymetry of the seabed is an important factor. Uh, it can be divided into two major areas uh, the continental shelf, with the relatively shallow waters, and the deep ocean, separate from the shallow area by the okay. continent. It's only uh, 10 to 12 along the Cantabrian coast. So the work provided in the project uh, reflects the nature uh, of the seabed, which is composed of uh, different types of sediment. So the English Channel, the Celtic Sea, mm -hmm. Julie, I'm sorry to disturb you if you can hear me, but um, I don't know if you're picking it up from your side, but it's very hard to hear your audio. So, okay. yeah. Can you do something to adjust your audio there? Because otherwise it's going to be really difficult to hear you. Is it better? Ah, yeah, that's, yeah. Just, no, it's my microphone. Okay. There's a bit of an echo now. Just count to five so that we can check. Just do a count to five there. Okay, I hope it will be better now. So, okay, that's better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the seabed of the Bay of Biscay on the Iberian coast ecoregion is uh, dominated by sand on muddy sand area, with a, a large mud area in the Gulf of Cadiz on the northern portion of the Bay of Biscay. So next slide, please. So the state of the heart uh, has been, which has been produced, underlines the strong influences exerted by this uh, hydrodynamics on the diversity of ecosystem formed in the region. Um, likewise, due to the topographical variability with estuaries, wetland, coastal lagoons, rocky cliffs, rocky shore, uh, sandy and muddy shore, the coastline is, high, is uh, highly diversified and support uh, productive ecosystems. Uh, as example, many of the larger animal species associated with the benthic or the pelagic habitats are of commercial interest with uh, several species of crabs, lobster, uh, squallops on other bivalve seafish, uh, particularly in the septic sea ecoregion, or cold water species such as whiting and pollax uh, that only occur in the north of north of uh, Portugal. So fish diversity is high in the Sim Atlantic area regarding its wide latitudinal expansion, but the report also reminds that there are also habitats on, on species of particular content, such as uh, those cited in the host park convention like uh, coral gardens, deep sea sponging aggregation, uh, intertidal mud flats, male beds and zostera beds, and many others. So uh, time is too short today uh, to present in more detail these habitats and species present in the study area. Uh, this is why I indicated this uh, link to the full study uh, deliverable, which is uh, already available on the Sim Atlantic website. Uh, and in addition, uh, several Details are also available in the work carried out in the SimNorad and the SimSet project, with therefore a much more complete development on the challenge, challenge uh, of preserving those uh, ecosystems. Okay, so next slide, please. So activities. Uh, well, nine activities were selected for, for this study, um, for this project. Uh, I'm not going to give a detailed update of the situation uh, of each of the sector of activity. But we can, however, separate them into two categories. Uh, the first one is made up of uh, historical activities. And some of these uh, historical activities are considered to be uh, in stagnation. Uh, this is notably the case of uh, aquaculture or the aggregate extraction. Also, there are strong differences according to the region for these two activities. And there are also activities that can be considered in decline. 
this is the case for some fishing gear or uh, oil and gas exploitation. Um, these two activities are notably concerned by uh, policies to reduce activity as part of the reduction of uh, fishing efforts of the, or the decarbonization of the member states. Next slide, please. And then uh, there are also a second category made up of uh, activity globally in expansion. Uh, in this category, there are also so-called uh, all activities such as uh, shaping or uh, yachting. And also activities considered to be new, such as uh, renewable marine energy, uh, new leisure practice at sea, and uh, even uh, scientific research, which is uh, experiencing a strong growth with the uh, development of new studies around all other sector of activities at sea. So an inventory of each activity is uh, actually in development, and the um, project on uh, several states are also available, notably. Um, in the MSP platform. And then one of the objectives of the project is to work on the development of uh, evolution scenario for these activities. So in the past, uh, several projects have uh, already made it possible to develop uh, some scenarios, building methods. Uh, some scenarios have been developed by uh, taking into account different criteria, some, such as um, the forecast on the resource demand, the technological development, the development strategy adopted by each sector, and um, in most cases, interaction with other activities are considered, are, are considered sorry, as a determinant factor uh, in defining uh, these scenarios. However, the study of activity over a large geographical area comes up against the difficulty of having a precise uh, data for each activity. Likewise, uh, if the analysis of theoretical interaction is a useful tool to identify theoretical potential interaction, uh, in real life, some of this conflict might not occur or might be punctual. Uh, some of them, uh, for some of them, the solution may be found through management intervention, while others may have some uh, special implication. This is why the, this kind of analysis needs to be complemented by a context-based uh, analysis, uh, as interactions are normally context on the management based and cannot be uh, defined by a simple uh, spatial overlapping. So, this is a rationale behind the methodology currently developed by the Instituto Español de Oceanografía as part of the Semi-Atlantic project. This work will not focus on defining some scenarios, but on developing a ready-to-use method to support the strategic thinking aimed at, uh, aimed at local decision makers with the MSP project. In summary, the work developed a methodology to characterize uses on their potential future interaction in a specific context in order to identify for some the best of the best approach uh, in the MSP uh, by developing uh, some targeted recommendations. So to do so, the aim of the methodology is to simplify a complex interaction by splitting, splitting it into uh, small building blocks used to construct uh, exploratory, exploratory scenarios. So the method therefore proposed to characterize each activity according to two variables, internal categories and external characteristics, as you can see uh, on this slide. And then once characterized, each activity will be confronted among others in, in order to build the micro scenarios and to identify, identify sorry, local key drivers of uh, integration. So uh, a special focus is given uh, to the output formats uh, of the guidelines of the methodology. So in order to be attractive and ready to use for competent authorities on the MSP practitioners, a handbook will be produced uh, presenting the ready applicable, applicable knowledge developed in this task. So again, time is lacking today to go into details in the, this methodology and the job is not over yet, but this work will be available at the end of the project and uh, it should represent a, a good added value to, to the semi project. So this is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Karen, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Julian, for that. OK, thank you. Now, um, we don't have any specific questions in here at the moment for Julian, so we will move on. But do please, during our next session, if you want to ask the speakers a question, just submit them through the Q&A box. Keep the chat for technical issues or 
um, for conversation and then just put your questions through the Q&A box. Now, our next panelist is Chris McDougall, project leader of the Assistance Mechanism for Implementation of MSP, who are responsible for the hosting and management of the European MSP platform. Chris is going to give an update on MSP in European Atlantic nations, and then he is going to segue his speech straight to our third speaker for this opening session, and that's Stephen Jay, Senior Lecturer in Marine Planning at the University of Liverpool. And Stephen will, will present the status for the UK. But first, we're going to hear from Chris. So good morning to you, Chris, and over to you. Good morning, Karen. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Julien, for the uh, useful geographical uh, update or, or context of, of the region we're discussing. Um, I think many people may be aware of the uh, the European MSP platform and, and the assistance mechanism, but very briefly, uh, our role is to support European member states and the European Commission on all aspects relating to marine spatial planning and the directive uh, and its implementation. Against requests, we provide support to European member states uh, in the implementation of the MSP directive and for the purposes of this discussion, importantly, the European MSP platform provides a global overview on MSP and the European Union uh, ongoing projects uh, and, and, and different aspects related to the individual sea basins and the, and the member states. Next slide, please. Um, the European MSP platform can be found at the address below. As I said, it, it highlights country information, sea basin information, ongoing and completed projects, uh, as well as the, the upcoming and, and recently delivered training events and, and, and seminars such as this one. Uh, next slide, please. If, if, you, uh, if you explore the European MSP platform, you'll, you'll find descriptions of the sea basins uh, and also information regarding geography and ecosystems. Uh, maybe not, not uh, all the information that was presented a few moments ago by Julien, but, uh, but obviously there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information in there that, that supports the ongoing MSP. Um, the reason I'm sort of helping you navigate this is obviously we don't have time to go into the specifics of all the MSPs, but if anyone would like to find out more information, uh, you can navigate through the European MSP platform to, to hopefully find the information you need. Next slide, please, Serge. Um, and as I say, when we get into the country's information, this specific information regarding the marine waters, the overview of the maritime uses, the relevant MSP authorities, contacts, the legislation, and, and links to relevant practices, plans, and, and, and projects which, which are ongoing. Next slide, please, Serge. The, uh, as best as possible, these updates are, are um, com you know, completely up to date, but obviously the, the, the speed with which MSP is moving uh, at, at this current time is extremely quick. Um, but the situation for France, as, as is currently recorded on the platform, is uh, the, the French MSP recognizes four maritime regions. As you can see on the map, there's the Eastern Channel of the North Sea, the North Atlantic, Western Channel, the Southern Atlantic, and the Mediterranean. The, um, uh, the, the relevant authority is the Ministry of the Sea. Um, the, uh, the draft MSP was published in September 2018. The final version of the MSP was submitted to the National Environment Agency uh, fairly recently. Feedback was due uh, and may well have been received on the 5th of May before the plan will enter public uh, and cross-border consultation. Uh, the, the final plan is expected to be uh, published and, and transmitted to the Commission in, in 2021. Next slide, please, Serge. Situation with Ireland. Uh, obviously, there's some colleagues online that will know this situation better than I, but I, I hope uh, I'm, I'm providing the, the, the most relevant information. Uh, the Irish maritime area comprises parts of the Irish, Celtic, as well as the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, at this point, it's a single maritime plan, although it is, uh, it is anticipated that perhaps in the future there will be more detailed regional planning produced. Um, the, the relevant uh, MSP authority recently changed uh, name. They are now the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, and they are a partner of the Sim Atlantic Project, who are one of the hosts of this meeting. The draft National Marine Planning Framework, which is Ireland's MSP, was published in November 2019. And actually, the final MSP was passed by Irish government only last week and will be sent to the European Commission uh, as soon as practical. 
Next slide, please. Portugal uh, is, has one of the largest maritime areas in Europe, uh, which, which obviously doesn't, doesn't make the situation any easier for them, including several um, uh, archi archipelagic regions offshore. Uh, each, of, each of the MSPs is, is being uh, the, uh, hosted or, or, or coordinated, let's say, by a se separate um, responsible body. So one for the Azores, one for Madeira and, and one for mainland Portugal. Um, as far as we're aware, the final MSP is, is still uh, expected in, in 2021. And uh, next slide, please, Serge. Um, and situation for Spain. Uh, the, uh, the Ministry of Ecological Transition is the authority responsible for uh, the coast and marine environment, but it's the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, which is, is also responsible for fisheries. So the, uh, the responsible sort of responsibility for coordination is, is, uh, is sort of a shared one. Uh, Spain is moving forwards on the technical development of, of plans for its five sub-regions. Um, the final MSP is anticipated in May 2021 before being passed to public and cross-border consultation, as well as the uh, undertaking strategic environmental assessment. Next slide, please, Serge. If, if anyone has any information or, or, or additional uh, questions regarding the, the Atlantic region, um, the uh, European MSP platform has, a, has an established team, and, and Frederick Herpers is the uh, is the dedicated MSP expert for the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, on the European MSP platform, there is also a help desk where where you can submit questions or requests for support, um, and and we we uh, we aim to respond to them within 48 hours. We would very much like to receive your questions. As Karen said, I will now pass to Stephen Jay to provide the situation uh, in the in the UK, which falls out of the geographic falls outside of the geographical scope of the of the uh, assistance mechanism and the European MSP platform. Thank you, Stephen. Over to you. Thank you, Chris. Well, the United Kingdom no longer comes under the terms of the European Union's Maritime Spatial Planning Directive, but in fact has been following a very similar timeline. And certainly uh, plans are now coming forward, uh, similarly to those of uh, the EU member states. Uh, the UK uh, Marine Planning System, as it's called, rather than Maritime Spatial Planning, is a devolved activity. And as you can see on the map on the right hand side, it's something which has been uh, has come under the responsibility of each of the four jurisdictions that make up the UK, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and you can see the respective marine areas uh, showing in the map there. And each of these jurisdictions has its own MSP authority, as you can see listed in the bullet points there, including the Marine Management Organisation for England, which was a new agency set up partly to deliver uh, marine planning and also Marine Scotland for Scotland, whereas Northern Ireland and Wales have got departmental responsibilities. What you can also see indicated on the map there is that each of the authorities is going about marine planning in quite a different way. So the shading uh, that you can see around Scottish waters indicates that they actually have a two tier system. So it's quite a complicated picture of marine planning that's developing. And we can see this in a bit more detail on the next slide, please. So for England, first of all, the top left hand corner there, you can see that the marine area has been split up into different plan areas, 11 of them, 11 of them in all. Uh, four have now been completed and there are plans in place for all those uh, four areas and the others are underway and making good progress. So this is effectively a rolling programme, which has been quite useful in that it means that experience has been gained along the way as the Marine Management Organisation has progressed from one plan area to the next. For Scotland, as I was just mentioning on the top right hand uh, map there, you can see that there is a two tier system. So there's a, a national marine plan for the whole marine area, which was completed in 2015, quite early on in fact. But now there's a second tier of planning, which is just starting to get underway for the more coastal waters. And there are these 11 inshore plan areas um, which at various stages are developing a plan for their more uh, local areas. For Wales, the bottom left hand corner there, there's a single plan covering both the inshore and the offshore waters in dark blue and light blue respectively, and that was completed in 2019. In Northern Ireland, again, there's a single plan underway covering the whole of the marine area, including small offshore area you can see 
in the bottom right hand corner there. Um, a draft was completed in 2018, but there's been a bit of a, a political holdup in bringing that to adoption. So that just gives you a very quick overview of current progress in the UK. And with that, I'll hand back to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Stephen. And maybe, Chris, if you can turn your mic on too. Now, um, please do send in some questions if you would like to put them to our panellists. Um, but we don't have any through the Q&A as far as I can see at the moment. Let me just double check. I don't think so. Um, but let me put one or two questions anyway that we have. I suppose, Chris, first to you, both very interesting, Stephen and Chris, to see the progress that's being made. But what about COVID, Chris? What kind of an impact has COVID had on the MSP process? And I suppose in particular, the definition of the objectives of the plan. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, well, we, we're we aware that COVID has had uh, has a number of impacts, particularly in, in delaying some of the consultation uh, processes. Uh, when we when we attend the member states expert group meetings, we're we're uh, we're acutely aware that uh, you know countries are saying that they've been unable to launch consultation processes as a result of COVID. So. When, when I presented the brief status, you, you'll see that most of the countries are, are ready to move to consultation. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this is the anticipated uh, next step following the, following the delays caused by COVID. And then take us through that. They're moving, going to move to consultation. What happens then? Um, well, assuming this, uh, obviously it depends the, the response is received, but uh, the, the plans are, are opened up to public consultation where, where people are given the, uh, uh, the opportunity to, to discuss and comment on what has been presented. Um, and perhaps uh, more importantly, in the context of what we're discussing here, uh, neighbouring countries are also given the opportunity to comment on, on what is contained within that plan, because obviously where we're talking about shared sea space um the the you know the plan of of one country may well have impacts on on uh the plan of a neighboring country and and the the cross-border discussion and, and uh, engagement is, is so critical in in ensuring that these plans are complementary and uh, and work together so okay um Stephen before I go to you we actually have a question which probably is for you Chris but but Steve it's Stephen if it's for you take it um it's from Mike Elliott Mike thank you very much for your question wants to know the Spanish and Portuguese plans include the Atlantic archipelagos but does France include its overseas territories in the Atlantic Chris is that a question for you uh, it, it probably would be. I would. I would have to come back on that one. Um, I am. I am uh, speaking uh, in a slightly different capacity to normal. Certainly, the ones I discussed uh, represent the the individual maritime regions of France. So I don't think the overseas territories are included in those. But what France is doing with regards to their uh, overseas territories, I would need to revert on. But uh, I will. I will come back to Mike. Uh, before the end of this, uh, before the end of this session, on on that response. Okay, good. So, and you'll put it in your response through the Q and A. Then, will you? Um, I will. In, yeah. in the back, that's great. And um, Stephen, one for you from Neil Alonkel. Thank you for your question, Neil. How do you articulate the planning scales adequately? Um, Scotland Global Plan 2015 versus local plans in progress. UK integration of the four national plans. Stephen. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I don't think that there's a, a, a clear strategy for integration, except that there is cooperation, obviously, between the different UK jurisdictions. Uh, so, for example, the uh, MMO's plans at border with Scotland will most certainly be talking to Marine Scotland in developing those plans. So there is a, a measure of consultation that's going on between the MSP or Marine Planning Authorities within the UK. Um, Having said that, there is an overarching strategy as well, which perhaps I should have mentioned, called the Marine Policy Statement. And this is a UK-wide uh, high-level uh, policy uh, statement, which was agreed by all four jurisdictions. So that gives a broad vision and high-level objectives that all the authorities are following in developing their individual marine plans. Okay, um, thanks, Stephen. Bernadette Snow um, has a question. Thanks for your question, Bernadette. Are the public neighbours only consulted once the plans are developed? Chris, I presume that's one for you. 
uh, it probably is uh, the I mean the simple answer is I think it's up to the it's up to the uh, individual member states um, I'm, I'm going to actually pass to Jay on this but uh, Stephen because he uh, he is more familiar with the, the individual processes um, as I said I'm, I'm stepping in on this one but um, okay so Stephen do you want to take that question then yeah, sure. No, certainly there should be, well, <laughs> there certainly should be uh, wide public participation throughout the entire um, pr uh, planning process and not just at the end. And certainly that's the case with the MSP processes that we are aware of. Um, and ideally, of course, this is an iterative process, so the public has the opportunity to comment at a draft stage, for example, for the plan, as well as uh, at a final draft. Um, but having said all of that, of course, it's very challenging to get the public to bring their views forward because often it's not something that the general public is very aware of. And that's something that the European Commission has been very concerned about um, to try to get broader public uh, interest and, uh, and contribution, I think, to MSP as a whole. But it is a challenge that we face, I think, throughout the MSP world, let's say. Okay, thank you for that. Alan Quentrick has a question. Morning, everybody. How do how will national plans and the Atlantic Ash uh, Atlantic Action Plan how can they be connected? Governance, etc. Alan wants to know who Stephen or Chris. Actually, I was going to say uh, I would suggest we come to that one towards the end because obviously in session three. Uh, you know, the, these are the kind of questions that we're we're looking for uh, to to uh, you know to shape the vision, and uh, I, th I think that would be a nice one to touch on as as we uh, as we come into session three, if if that's okay with Alan. Okay, Alan. So perhaps you can resubmit that question when we come to session three, if you wouldn't mind, because it may disappear if more and more questions come in. So will you? Put, put that back in during session three. Um, Shona Turnbull has a comment to make, which is at a regional level, we talk cross boundary to each other, for example, Shetland and Orkney. And then maybe we'll just take this final question from Christina, who wants to know regarding the new approach to the blue economy just adopted by the European Commission, do you think it might influence MSP objectives of national processes? Thank you very much for your question, Christina. Chris or Stephen for that one. Chris, uh, I mean, I, I'll I'll certainly highlight that obviously MSP is a is an iterative process. These these plans are not anticipated to be uh, you know uh, fixed. This is they are live documents which which will continue to be uh, updated and, and developed. And certainly within the the directive, the requirement is on countries to to obviously establish a plan, implement it, monitor it, evaluate it, and then and then provide uh, future updates. Um, sev several of the EU member states are actually on on version two uh, of of their MSP. So I think. Uh, Certainly, uh, the, the latest policies and, and uh, um, commitments being adopted by the European Commission will, uh, will influence the, 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 the MSP processes and, and will require the MSP processes uh, and the MSP plans themselves to be updated in, in, in due course. I don't know if Stephen wants to add anything extra. Well, only as far as the UK is concerned, of course, um, it's withdrawn itself from um, strategies like the, the, the blue economy, uh, unfortunately, many of us would say. Uh, so we can only hope that there will continue to be a dialogue and uh, cooperation uh, between the UK and the EU on strategies like this. OK, well, look, um, we've run out of time for this particular se session. Thank you so much for submitting your questions for Stephen and Chris. Please do keep putting in your questions through the Q&A box. But Stephen and Chris, thank you very much. We'll say goodbye to you for the moment and we'll move on. By the way, if you're just joining us, you're very welcome to this webinar. My name is Karen Coleman. I'm a journalist and a broadcaster from Ireland and I'm moderating today's webinar. So now we come to our second session, which is on transboundary issues. And the aim of this session is to briefly present the subject of transboundary issues within the European Atlantic. Now, importantly, the presentations which you will hear reflect on just a few of the transboundary issues that the project focuses on, but they will highlight the transboundary dimensions and its importance in defining a vision. 
For this session, we have three speakers. Each speaker will deliver a short presentation, and then I will put a couple of questions to them after their session, after each one of their sessions, rather than waiting for all three to make their presentations. It should be move uh, uh, more dynamically that way. So again, while each individual presenter is speaking, please do submit your questions if you have them for that speaker during that process, and then I will put them to the individual presenter. So our first presenter is Magali Abjian, and her topic is development of knowledge on the organization of data and MSP plans. And Magali is a geographic information systems officer at SHOM. She's held that position for the last four years. And previously she worked on the Sin West Med project, but she's now responsible for data use and sharing for the Sim Atlantic project. Magali, over to you. Good morning, Karen. Thank you for, for your introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, today, I, I will present you the work we realize on data use and sharing in the uh, Insim Atlantic project. Um, in particular, I will uh, present you the development of knowledge on the organization of data and also on, uh, on MSP plan in, uh, in the Atlantic region. Next slide, please. We have uh, realized uh, several uh, works to, to improve the data use and sharing. For this, uh, we follow uh, different uh, objectives. The first is uh, to gather information from uh, official sources within the, the Atlantic uh, Sea Basin. Um, another objective is also to ease access to this information and also to reinforce the knowledge of the data organization in the member states, and also to enhance um, the knowledge of the, the planning process uh, in the member states. Um, because uh, we do this work because uh, the European Commission uh, needs to know uh, which are the documents associated to the member state plan, but also the, all the data and information uh, that support the plan. Um, and to go further, uh, the work relies on, on data, uh, allows a, a comparative analysis of data between the, the different states uh, in Atlantic region and contributes to, to build uh, the Atlantic vision. Uh, so all the tools or documents produced in, uh, in these components are uh, available in the, in the website. Uh, dedicated to Sim Atlantic component in uh, in uh, sorry in a uh, data component in Sim Atlantic project, I put uh, the link of this uh, website um, at the bottom of the slide, and at the right you can see uh, uh, a picture to illustrate uh, this website with the main uh, the, the first elements. So I after the meeting I invite you to consult uh, this uh, web uh, website to add more information and to, to look the different documents and tools. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, first, the first tool is a, is a geo portal. We developed a data portal for the need of the project. Uh, this, uh, this data portal centralizes ge geographical data sets collected from, uh, from national sources will event for the MSP. Um, this data portal is uh, mainly based on the, the web services and uh, you can, uh, uh, the, the layers uh, are gathered in a data catalog and the layers are organized uh, by categories but also by countries to ease the use and to facilitate uh, the research for, the, for users. Um, in this, uh, in this uh, data portal, there is different functionalities for example, it's possible to display a predefined maps with specific layers or specific zoom. It's possible also to input an external web services for, for build uh, its own maps. And um, for each layer, layers, it's possible to display uh, the, um, the layer information with, for example, the producer of the, the layer. Uh, the metadata link and the different web services available. Um, and on this data portal, it's possible also to translate 
the title of the layer. So it's possible to have the or original uh, title, but also the translation in English. Uh, here also to, to improve the, the reuse of the information. So um, I put uh, also the link of this data portal in the slide. So <laughs> I, I invite you to consult it and manipulate the different functionality of, uh, of this data portal. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, we, are, um, we have uh, realized uh, country fact sheets. We produce one fact sheet by country of the Team Atlantic project. This fact sheet uh, gather general information on the MSP process and also uh, information on the operation of national portal, geo portal, when existing. And uh, this document was uh, where also the opportunity to address technical question to the competent authority to improve the knowledge of the data organization. And uh, for in each uh, uh, fact sheet, we have uh, realized a summary table with different topic. Uh, and um, this summary table gathers the main information on the MSP process in each country. You can see the different topic in the, in the slide. For example, uh, there is the name of the competent authority, the name of the geoportal and its uh, URL, uh, link. And uh, for example, the access to, to plan uh, in a textual format or in a, in spatial format. Um, next slide, please. And to complete uh, the fact sheet, we have uh, realized uh, um, MSP plan access table. As you can see in the previous uh, presentation for each country, there is a different information. Uh, regarding the MSP process and regarding the national plan. So uh, we want to, to realize a, a summary table to provide a comparative information on, uh, on access to MSP plan um, in, the, in the Atlantic uh, region. So this table covers text and spatial format of plan and uh, it's, a, it's a tool to highlight uh, commonalities between, uh, between the states and also to highlight the specificity of specificities of each one. So uh, it's a very useful uh, document because it's possible to, to realize a comparative analysis uh, with, this, uh, with this information. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, to finish, we, in parallel, we have uh, realized a survey in 2020 um, for partners and also for the major stakeholder uh, in, uh, in MSP. Uh, this uh, survey um, covers four topics. First is the specificity related to cross-border cooperation. Also, uh, the information uh, about the national geo portal dedicated to MSP and the needs uh, regarding uh, uh, European geo portal dedicated to MSP2 and, um, and different information regarding the plan, means, and, uh, and format uh, in which uh, the plan will be accessible. So, uh, we have uh, gathered the different uh, results of this survey in a report. The report are already uh, available on the CIM Atlantic uh, website dedicated to, to the data and also in the CIM Atlantic, uh, the general CIM Atlantic website. So I invite you to consult this report to, to have the different uh, results and an overview of the, of the elements um, gathered. So next slide, please. Thanks. To, to give an overview for you today, I, I put uh, in, the, in this slide uh, some results of the survey. You can, you can see, uh, for example, about the, the specificity. Um, there is a real uh, consensus, uh, according to the contributors, uh, about the sharing of, uh, of data. It's very important to improve the, the share of, uh, of data and, and uh, of the information, uh, a majority uh, or, uh, of the contributors are uh, involved in action 
or steps to, to, to improve the data channeling or to improve the data harmonization with their neighbors. Uh, and another example regarding the national geopartal, uh, there is a, the major obstacle of the data channeling is the ownership of the data. It's a real limit to, to share uh, information. And uh, the, another example is regarding the European geopartal. The, um, the specific feature expected with regarding the European Geopartal dedicated to MSP are first the quick access to metadata, then the access to web service, and uh, the access to the translation of the, of the information. So we just uh, uh, sum of, uh, of the, of the results, of course. Uh, so the next slide, please. So uh, that is the end of, uh, of my presentation. Thank you for, for your attention. And uh, back to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Magali. And that was a lot of information that you gave there. Um, very interesting. Now, let me just check. We don't have a specific question in for you yet, but I have one or two. But if you do, um, attendees, if you want to put a question to Magali, then please submit it through the question and answer session. But I suppose um, maybe, Magali, if I can put one or two questions to you, it sounds like a, you know there's a lot of information being gathered. But what's the main purpose of the data portal? Uh, yes, thank you, Karen, for, for this question. Um, the the GeoPortal is uh, it's a demonstrator. It, it is a tool for the project. Uh, the objective is to publish uh, in the same GeoPortal the different information of, uh, of the several country of, um, the countries involved in the, in the project. So we want to publish uh, on it uh, the data related to, to the MSP with cross-border stack or issues. And also the MSP plan uh, of the of the countries involved in, in the project. So um, it's uh, it has been developed only for the need of the project, and uh, it will not be maintained after uh, after Sim Atlantic. That actually was my next question, which you you've answered, and maybe so. The question is, why won't it be maintained? So you're saying that it's not going to be maintained after the project closes, then, is it not? Yes, uh, yes, uh, after the project, the, the tool uh, will not be uh, continue uh, to, to update uh, the data or, or different uh, functionalities. And so, yes. Which sector then of the public do you want to target by, you know, by the tools and the information presented? Um, there is different uh, targeted uh, with the... Uh, for, for this document or tool. First, uh, I think it's a Sim Atlantic partnership to, to share the knowledge uh, regarding data available or regarding MSP process uh, actors or just the official sources. Um, but uh, um, uh, this work is also intending to administration in charge of the, of the MSP. Uh, in, in Atlantic countries, uh, and also uh, other people intended or involved uh, in, uh, in MSP process, for example, researchers or students, and, uh, and I think also emanate uh, human activities, as it, in, it is in charge uh, to disseminate national plans uh, together, and uh, in particular, largely for this, uh, the survey provides input related to um, to interest of the Atlantic countries in a, in a European uh, geoportal to MSP. We have a, a question in for you um, from Michael Elliott. Michael, thanks for your question. Magali, a nice talk. How do you ensure that the data sets being collated are compatible and consistent with those collated in the ICES maps and synthesis and the OSPAR QSR data? So we have a sing single data set. Um, uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, we, we have don't compare the data published uh, in the in the geoportal with the with the ICIS maps. Um, but for for the for for realize the uh, inventory and to publish a uh, data catalog in the geoportal. We have uh, based uh, our work uh, on official sources, and uh, we we uh, work with the 
with partners in each country. So uh, we are work uh, differently, um, but we use the official sources and national sources as it possible. And uh, um, so I think uh, it's, uh, it's a good data uh, and very relevant for MSP process. Uh, I, I want to add uh, something for, for the um, inventory. We have used the previously work realized in uh, Simkel project and Synorwek project. And we focus in Sim Atlantic on the data uh, relevant in, uh, in transboundary context, context. Okay. So, and somebody, Juan Ronco, wants to know did you work with EMODnet? Um, um yes we we work with emonet uh, we have um, realized uh, different um, feedback uh, with emonet um, because we use uh, the data to to publish uh, on uh, on the geo portal and uh, I, I think uh, we will work with emonet too uh, to 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 share um, feedback to uh, on the Sim Atlantic and uh, the different uh, use uh, issues uh, meet on the, the data sharing. Okay, Magali, thank you so much for that, for your presentation and mm -hmm. taking the time to answer the questions. Thanks to you too for putting the questions to Magali, and I'm sure you will have questions too for our next speakers as well. So Magali, thank you for that. You can turn off your video now. You. And we'll move on the next session topic is titled Investigating Land Sea Interactions in the Irish Sea and Beyond. That's going to be delivered by Hannah Jones, a researcher at the University of Liverpool. Hannah has worked on numerous EU funded projects, including Aqua Cross and the Celtic Seas Partnership Project. She's currently working on the Sim Atlantic Project, leading the work on land sea interactions. Hannah is also on the Secretariat for the Irish Sea Maritime Forum and a member of the Liverpool Institute for Sustainable Coasts and Oceans. Hannah, over to you. Thank you very much, Karen, uh, for that introduction. Um, just to go, uh, yeah, just to thank the organisers for inviting me to speak today. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about land sea interactions, um, specifically looking at the transboundary element that's evident in the Irish Sea. Um, I've started with this as my first slide, um, as it highlights the complexity that's involved with land sea interactions. Um, as you can see, there's a lot going on. Um, but the, the concept of land sea interactions is not a new one. Um, it's probably been talked about for about 30 years. Um, sometimes called something different, um, land-ocean interactions, land-sea integration, um, and it's also been looked at being managed via different mechanisms such as uh, integrated coastal zone management or ICZM as you might know it. Um, but there's been a lot more research into land-sea interactions over the past five years, probably since the uh, MSP directive came about. Um, and a lot of this has been focused uh, within Europe, um, particularly in the Baltic. Um, some of the work um, done as part of the EU funded Baltic projects. And I would recommend that those of you that are interested in the topic go and have a look at those as well. Um, so the picture here was produced as part of a, a previous project I was involved in, um, MSP LSI, which was an ESPON funded project. Um, and it does highlight um, what a complex phenomena that we have here. They're wide ranging um, and also wide reaching. So the activities on land and on sea can have far reaching implications that go well beyond your national territorial jurisdictions or in fact, your, your maritime boundaries as well, uh, including the EZ in many cases. Um, so the question that we look to address uh, in some Atlantic is how do we manage these and how do we manage these uh, in an Atlantic context? Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this, uh, 
This framework that you're looking at here was produced as part of the uh, MSP LSI project that I mentioned earlier. Um, and it highlights just how complex um, and dynamic this phenomena is. But it also provided us with a stepping stone for um, how to go about scoping, looking at LSI in the Atlantic. Um, there's interactions between socioeconomic activities um, and the natural biogenical processes that go with them, but, but also um, the complex governance arrangements that can both directly and indirectly impact those. Um, and sometimes, as I've mentioned, these can go well beyond country borders. So you're not just considering the, the, the governance arrangements within one country, it's often multiple um, and involves, you know, a great degree of stakeholder engagement. Um, next slide, please. So when we when we started the project, we were thinking about how, how do we look at this and how do we look at this uh, within a case study area. Um, so given the, the, the partner organizations we had involved, we created um, a Lancy Interactions working group, uh, which involved project members that included um, the Department for um, Local Government, Housing and Heritage in Ireland, and um, DARA, the Department for the Environment, Agriculture and Rural Affairs in Northern Ireland, um, to try and pick um, two specific case studies where we could test um, techniques that have been used to investigate LSI within that area. Um, and, and following these discussions, we decided on a, a value chain analysis of offshore wind and um, a modification of the uh, bowtie analysis that's been carried out previously in a, in a different project, which I'll come on to later, um, looking at specifically shellfish aquaculture and, uh, and its relation to climate change uh, within Irish sea locks. Um, and these case studies were interesting, particularly because we're looking at land sea interactions from a transboundary perspective. Um, I just want to say here before we move on, uh, if you look at the, the map on the right, um, I'd just like to highlight that all the purple squares you can see um, are wind farms that are under investigation or proposed and those that are green they're outside our case study area but they're ones that are active that the, there is a green one in the irish in the irish waters the irish sea but it's it's very small very small that's our play bay um next slide please okay so um firstly i'll look at the the offshore wind value chain analysis so we we started that um, by discussing what what we were going to which sector we were going to look at and offshore wind for various reasons because of the importance to to the national importance of the countries we're working in we wanted the case studies to have a relevance to the countries that we were working with um, and that the methodologies that we use were were going to be used. Um, so the decision for this sector was based around uh, climate change, obviously, that the need to develop um, blue-green energy uh, within Europe, also energy security um, for an island nation. Um, I think that's crucially important at, at, at these times for various reasons, uh, and also to try and promote transboundary work working between the between the different stakeholders. Um, so the core area we focused on was the Northern Irish and Irish waters of the Irish Sea. Um, if we, I'm not going to ask you to go back a slide, but if you can remember, all of those purple blocks were actually in the Irish waters of the Irish Sea, and there's none in the Northern Irish waters of the Irish Sea. But that does not mean that they don't have a relevance for Northern Ireland. Um, and that, 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 that is the point of this type of analysis. Um, if you can go back to the next slide, please. Um, so 
uh, I've gone through here on the left the, the different um, steps that we went through. Um, but obviously the key issues that we focused on in this project are steps three, four and five. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, please, I'll explain a little bit why. So obviously, uh, you'll have seen with all the purple squares that you were presented with earlier, that this is an emerging market in this in this area. This type of analysis has been carried out before um, as part of MSP LSI, but it was looking at uh, offshore wind farming in, uh, in the Dutch North Sea which is very established. We're looking at completely different steps of this value chain. For example, in the Dutch North Sea, I think we're starting to look at, um, beginning to look at decon decommissioning of some farms. And we're very much in the, the operation and maintenance, the, the latter parts of this, of this value chain. Um, in Ireland, we're looking at a very different scenario. Um, so the value chain analysis that's been conducted um, comes with a fairly large bit of trying to predict what will happen and what will what will things look like spatially going on from there. Uh, we also have to think about the changing um, governance landscape that we're looking at. Um, obviously, countries that ju they're just getting their marine spatial plans coming into play, uh, and particularly in Ireland as well. Um, there's legislation coming up, um, or, or just or recently been implemented, such as the the Maritime Bill for for Ireland, which seeks to kind of streamline the the process that will enable off offshore wind farming, which could change what we would have looked at three, four, five years down the line. Um, it makes the process a lot smoother, and obviously that changes the nature of the stakeholders that are involved. Um, as well. Um, if we go on to the next slide, please. So the, the second case study we looked at was looking at um, specifically shellfish aquaculture um, with it within the Irish Sea, but we focused on the, the Irish Sea locks, uh, locks Carlingford and Foyle. Um, now we've we initially wanted to use um, straight down the line, the bow tie analysis approach uh, that was used by Mike Elliott and Roman Cormier as part of the Ceres project. Um, I'd like to thank them now at this, at this time. I think, I think Mike's here, um, but for all their you know, uh, advice and, and guidance in, in how to view this. Um, because whilst the value chain analysis does provide you with certain advantages for certain sectors for a more ecologically or environmentally um, nuanced issue. Um, we didn't feel it was that appropriate. Um, so we looked at the both side approach and thought, yep, this is the way to go. Um, so I, I've, I've put down here just, just to highlight you how um, I've taken this from the Ceres project. So thank you to them. Um, how this can look. So you're looking at the, the, the problem you have, the causes, controls, problems, uh, consequences that can, can come of that. And on the right, you can see what a bow tie might look like. As you can see, it is, is very, um, very complicated. So following on from our discussions, uh, next slide, please. Um, we went on to talk to to Mike and his team, um, and also uh, other MSP authorities who've used other types of cause and effects analysis to, to in, in their MSP planning process in the development of their uh, marine spatial plans. Um, following these discussions, um, it was readily identified that it was a bit too involved to become part of a day-to-day -day marine planning process. Um, the list of issues that 
have a land sea interaction component for, for planning authorities uh, can run up into the thousands. Um, it just wasn't see, thought to be a, a realistic uh, option to, to address LSI in the time frame that was needed from a, a marine planning point of view. Um, so we looked at modifying the, um, um, the bow tie approach and integrating it with a, another approach that had been used in industry before, as bow tie has, um, called the structured what if technique or swift technique. Um, which is used to identify risks and establish safeguards and mitigation methods using pre-prepared checklists. So a, a bow tie specific for, for aquaculture, specific for shellfish output and specific for the region was created um, and then condensed into a spreadsheet that was sent to identified uh, key stakeholder groups within the region um, for discussion. So the stakeholders um, had access to the spreadsheet, they could choose what they thought was more or less important, what were the key issues, um, and then also suggest recommendations for how to address these issues. Uh, these were then followed sorry, up. Sorry, Hannah, sorry, I, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we do need you to start wrapping up now because we have a couple of more speakers as well. So if you wouldn't mind just finishing up, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that's sure. This is the last slide, it's fine. Um, okay, so um, yeah, this was this was used to, to identify the recommendations uh, that were involved. Um, next slide, please. Um, I don't need to talk about this really, because this is what's coming up and this is what will be discussed hopefully in the um, final um, Sim Atlantic conference. Um, so yes, that, that, that's it from me. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, if anyone does have any questions that go beyond the, the conference, please do uh, drop me an email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Again, very comprehensive um, presentation. Thank you so much. I'll just put one question to you. We don't have one specifically coming in through the Q&A, but of the two methodologies you discussed, are certain sectors or issues more suitable for investigation by one or the other? And if so, why? Um, yes, I think so. I think with land interactions being so, so complex, I, I um, for example, the value chain analysis um, from a socioeconomic perspective to find out where the benefit lies um, spatially and temporally, it's a great tool. Um, but for a more nuanced um, investigation into the um, ecological um, bio biodiversity and impacts, it's not really suitable, which is why we wanted to look at two. Um, and I think it's important to know that that land sea interactions can't be addressed by one method alone. I think you, you have to look at a, a series of different planning tools to do that. And just in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, a question I put to earlier speakers, and how did it impact the work you were undertaking? Um, quite a lot. I mean, originally, uh, all of our stakeholder engagement was planned um, to take place in public, actually, ironically, in European Maritime Day in Cork last year. Um, which obviously couldn't happen. Um, so we had to find new innovative ways to do that, to, to, to bring in um, online methods. Um, the use of the spreadsheet, for example, was born out of the, you know, the need to, what, the need to do everything online. Um, and also the increased time pressures of people, not, not everyone can be online all the time and no one wants to spend an entire day on Zoom. So, you know, we, we had to think outside the box a little bit. But I actually think it's been uh, quite an opportunity um, to, to find new ways of working. And I think it could be very useful going forward. OK, Hannah, we'll leave it there. But Hannah, thank you so much for your presentation and answering a few questions as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, now, Karen. our 
Thank you. Our final topic for this session will be on the Atlantic Action Plan and the blue economy. And that's going to be delivered by Frederick Herpers from the French National Hub for the Atlantic Action Plan AM and the Atlantic MSP expert for the Assistance Mechanism for Implementation of MSP. Frederick was previously an advisor to the French Prime Minister at the Secretary General de la Mer, where he contributed to the elaboration and adoption of the French maritime policy in 2009. Frederic, the stage is yours. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, everyone. I'm very happy to, to be there. Uh, I could have done a presentation for, for, for Chris, but we thought it would be better to, to, make, uh, to have various faces uh, to, to, to see how we are playing the game. And so I will be there to, to, to deal with and to make a short presentation about, about the Atlantic Action Plan. As you said, I'm the national hub uh, for France for, for, for this. And, Based to the, due to the link uh, with MSP, it was uh, it makes sense to, to make me to for me to make it uh, here. So next slide, <clears throat> thanks. Um, as Mr. Lindemann said at early uh, early beginning of uh, of uh, of this meeting, EU, European Commission. Uh, has confirmed that blue economy, and I would say, I really did it uh, more than less than ten years ago with uh, the Atlantic uh, Atlantic strategies, uh, which were which was adopted uh, to, to to work on cooperation with the Atlantic uh, oceans. Uh, this uh, this strategy consisted uh, with uh, the EU twenty twenty agenda uh, group. Identified challenges and new opportunity facing the Atlantic regions. Uh, Further, the Atlantic strategies, uh, an action plan was, uh, was also edited for the period for 2013, 2020, uh, with practical steps in order to boost the Atlantic Ocean Area Sustainable Blue Economy by 2020 by focusing effort on promotion of entrepreneurships, protections of en enhancements of uh, marine and coastal environment, improve accessibility, connectivity, and uh, also to create social inclusive and sustainable model of regional development. Uh, further, this, uh, uh, in order to take the lesson learned of the action plan, uh, a midterm assessment uh, was done of, of these action plans. We can, I would like to, to raise that thanks to this midterm review of the Atlantic Action Plan, more, more than 1,200 maritime projects related to the, to the action plans were, were monitored and nearly 6 billion euro on this must of investment could be associated or forced, uh, uh, associated to, uh, to, to, to this action plan. Um, all these achievements uh, are, are on uh, the European Maritime Data Hub, and it gives you also an illustration how the Atlantic Action Plan can be a driver and is a driver for the implementation uh, in, in the region, thanks to all of the stakeholders. Um, after this uh, midterm review, it had been decided and a new uh, version, uh, an updated version of the action plan 2.0 was adopted uh, in uh, July 2020. Next slide, please. This, and uh, it would be my main, my main way, area of presentation, this Atlantic action plan um, is, uh, is, of course, uh, as a, a main objectives and uh, as already presented uh, by Mr. Lineman in a, and, and recalled yesterday during by European Commission is really to unlock the potential of blue economy in the Atlantic and of course a sustainable blue economy. One more time focusing on the, on, on the issue to preserve marine ecosystem to contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigations. Of course, this regional action plan 2.0 is fully in line with the previous one, but also supporting global commitments for sustainable development, such as SDGs. Most of them, most of you may already know, must know all of them, 12, 13, 14, in order to, to, to consider the six action at regional level is also compliant with uh, the global answers for, led by the, the European Union, but also its member states. Of course, it's fully integrated with European Commission political, political priorities, in particularly or notably with European Green Deal and 
as, as I did my presentation before, before yesterday communication, of course, is fully in line with EC communication that we, that we had the pleasure to, to see yesterday. Next slide, please. So in order to do this, uh, this plan uh, is composed with four pillars to make a common vision reality. Um, as, as said by Mr. Lindemann, we have four pillars. Um, you, they are already displayed on, on the slide. <clears throat> you see that there's focus on port connectivity, another one which is more related to skills and ocean literacy, another one on marine urban energies, and last and not least, a one which is related to environment and coastal resilience. We have a transversal uh, axis, which are uh, research, development, innovations uh, on this. Even though we've got the feel, we may have the feeling that this, we, with uh, these four pillars, we've got part of segmentations, all these pillars are integrally inter interconnected and transregional trans level by nature. They are addressing key challenges aimed to foster blue growth in the area. They are also there in order to, to, to help, and, and maybe it will be a part of the answer of one question that we had uh, uh, in the previous sessions, is to develop a greater co territorial cooperation and cohesion in the Atlantic, Atlantic uh, European Atlantic areas. These objectives and these pillars uh, are, in a way, to support uh, the, the countries and the regions where, in a way, they are not fully able to meet these objectives on their own. And so it's really focusing on the cooperation and uh, between all the, all the actors in the, and in the Atlantic. The pillar implementation uh, uh, is done along a dedicated roadmap with endorser uh, uh, actions. All of them have been endorsed by the Atlantic Steering Committee. So we make also, in which you will find the, 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 the EU member states and other partners. So we make also a link and, and maybe a part of the answer regarding governance. Uh, next slide, please. Here, well, I will try to make it short and just to highlight, and as, as Felix said, MSP in a way is everywhere in the Atlantic Action Plan 2.0. And I just want to, to highlight in yellow, where you can consider how MSP can contribute to the actions and to the goals and, and the act, to the goals of each pillar. Uh, for instance, for, for with the development of motorways of the sea, with a, with a setup of a network of green ports, where you see at the same time each, uh, um, a need for MSP, but also for land sea interactions. The way to develop source shipping links in the area, so that where you are facing at the same time connectivity security protections of the environment. As, as Felix said, also MSP is, uh, is included in all anything, all the topics which are related to training, but also in national literacy in order to engage stakeholders, in order to understand what are the issues, what are the goals on the area and how in a way MSP can bring an answer uh, for, for, for this and to, to foster their engagement thanks to uh, public consultations. Next, please. On pillar three, you see marine renewable energy. It was already been discussed uh, just before by Anna on this. Uh, it's true that defining the best sites for marine renewable energy farms is really part of MSP uh, on which. But of course, Thanks to, 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 to the Atlantic Action Plan 2.0 and these objectives, which are to develop, of course, in line with EU, EU strategy related to, to the marine renewable energies, you see that it's already uh, a good way to develop, um, to, to develop MSP and to meet also these objectives, not only at national level, but at the sea, sea basin, uh, sea basin and, uh, level. And uh, for the pillar number four, you see that. Uh, part which has not really been uh, presented before, but you see that anything which are related to observations, monitoring, uh, uh, and structure, structurations and synergies between all the infrastructures, uh, such as embodnet uh, and all the activities, data storing or things like that, are to contribute to the coastal observation and protection in order to support the coastal resilience. And of course, as you may see, there's also the shared best practice on marine spatial planning to coastal adaptations. 
And like that, we are one more time making a link between MSP and lens interaction and maybe also with a land planet. Next piece. So as a conclusion, in order to make short, I, I can say, uh, to, 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 to my, to, according to me, but I think I'm not the only one, that Israeli Atlantic Action Plan 2.0 provide with a vision for the Atlantic to, to develop a sustainable blue economy for national, sub-national, and of course, a regional level. And I would say that knowledge, structured data, Services which are which are which, which were developed, for instance, uh, by by CIM Atlantic, are really pivotal to meet its goals, its, its goals at national and regional governments. For instance, for the implementation of our marine um, um, marine strategic framework directives, but also for my maritime spatial planning directives. So I would say. Uh, and not just because we are, it's not only an event, but it's, a, uh, for, 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 it's a joint event. I would say that doing so, SIM Atlantic is a project fully supporting Atlantic Action Plan 2.0. And thanks, it will make a link between the Atlantic Action Plan vision and the way you can develop a vision for MSP. Thanks to SIM Atlantic, I think that's the end. We will meet the objectives. Uh, this is for. So that's all for me and thank you for, for your information, for, for your attention. If you want to get more information, you I will have this on this website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederick. Very comprehensive presentation. Thank you very much for that. We have about five minutes, I think, uh, for questions before we take a quick break. So we have one actually coming in through the Q&A uh, question box and it's from Victor Cordero Penin. He wants <coughs> to know how could the MSP plans of Atlantic states contribute to the implementation of the Atlantic vision? And will these contributions be monitored somehow? So maybe you could take that question, please. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, well, I would say that, uh, first of all, I think that we have to keep in mind that MSP uh, our plans are, are, are meeting the objective of MSP directives, which is a, a new frame on, on that. Um, so, uh, and for which you will see, for instance, for they might when you consider MSP directives, that the, all the MSP are to address the blue economy on this. If you consider and uh, the, the four pillars of the Atlantic Action Plan 2.0, you will see that they are supporting also the blue economy. So the link is quite obvious, I would say. It's already there. Uh, you know that uh, you have to promote to, uh, to promote uh, on the four pillars, which are social, economic, and environment. And to consider that you do doing so, you, you in, in a way, in a nested approach, considering that you, you, you can consider CBSIN's national and local level, you can have an answer to, to drive it uh, for, for in such a way. For the, monitor, for the contribution and the way to have to be monitored for, for, for this, um, it's linked to the previous question that we had, which are which has related to governance. Um, you member states are part uh, of the uh, Atlantic Action Plan uh, uh, Steering Committee. They are also implementing the MSP at national level. They are already making the link. So reporting on their actions at, uh, for, uh, for at EU level, but also considering uh, and making also the link uh, with the Atlantic um, steering committee so it's up to us as a system mechanism for atlantic action plan also to help uh, to help the countries also thanks to european uh, msp platform to, to to do it to see which way we can monitor the implementation to make the link and considering that msp is not a, a standalone tool but uh, first of all, a tool answering the political needs and the strategic uh, visions which have been uh, defined at CBS in level, at national level. Okay, Frederick, thank you for that. And what, what, from your point of view, do you think are the main challenges when it comes to the implementation of the Atlantic Action Plan? Well, the, the main challenges is uh, integrations, I would say. Uh, integrations of, of the actions, integrations of the governance, and it's, it's what uh, Victor raised in, in a way. It's, here we are. Uh, it's true that if we consider all the exercise as isolated one, you, you can have a, you can be quite confident that you will be happy at your at your level. But the issue is to to make it consistent between all the level from the regional level to the local one. 
Uh, and for this, that means that we need a strong cooperation, good liaison between all the stakeholders, good liaison with, between the countries in order to support this. And I would say that maybe it's also, it's also part of the Atlantic Action Plan mechanism to support the pillar coordinators, the EU member states, thanks to the national hub, and of course, the, the, the commission in order to meet these objectives. And, and what kind of resources are allocated for it? For, for, for this, well, um, European Commission has set uh, since, uh, since most, uh, I would say, since the beginning, an assistance mechanism for this, uh, uh, in which you've got uh, one national hub per country, a central team dedicated for that, supporting the country, stakeholders, engagement in that. Uh, it's a permanent action. You can have more information on the contacts or on, on the slide uh, on my last presentation where you can get in touch. Um, and this is a, a permanent, uh, permanent resources for this. Engaging national, but I think also that is also very important to, to, to get uh, to, to engage also local stakeholders because you'll see and we see as so maybe another challenge that there are also other strengths uh, we are on and many opportunities uh, with funding opportunities, but we have to, 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 to make, um, make it consistent to support the, the actions. Uh, just a quick uh, maybe response for this last question from Michael Elliott. Frederick, mm. would you see that MSP in the Atlantic should be regarded as a part of the programme of measures for implementing the MSFD? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, yes, it's, it's highly dependent uh, uh, how, uh, how the countries have decided to, uh, to, to implement this. Uh, and if I make a short, a short uh, uh, example, for instance, for France, they, they have already done the, the choice to implement to have a joint implementation thanks to uh, from uh, MSFD and MSD. So uh, and make it consistent and considering that for for instance the French MSP, which is a document strategic de façade that it is, has an environmental pillar uh, which is which is we which answers the needs of uh, MSFD. So. Uh, Yes, we have to consider this. I would say it's all the more important to do so because uh, you, can't, um, you can't meet at the same time the development of blue economy without sustainability and, and environment. So we, you have to, uh, to, uh, to consider all of this all together. And it is an option which was taken by France in, in, since the beginning to make it consistent be, between blue, blue economy development and on the other end, um, protection, environmental, uh, environmental protection. Focus on developing a vision for MSP in this segment. So the aim of this session is to start to explore and define what a vision for MSP in the European Atlantic region could look like. And this will draw on experiences from colleagues in the Baltic, as well as the ongoing work under the SIM Atlantic project. We have two topics for discussion in this segment, and I will put some questions to our speakers after they have delivered their presentations. So our first topic is on long-term perspectives on the Baltic Sea region 2040. We have two speakers for this session. Firstly, we're going to hear from Elena Vedamani, Deputy Head of the VASAB Secretariat, <clears throat> and then, excuse me, Elena will hand over to Maria Topsidou, consultant at Spatial Foresight GmbH and contracted, <clears throat> excuse me, expert for the update of the VASAB long-term perspective. So Elena, we'll hand over to you first. The stage is yours. Thank you, Karen, very much for your kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, and I thank you also organizers for having me in this event. Uh, so my name is Elaine and I'm coming from Vasov Secretariat. It's uh, up in the north of, uh, of the Europe and in my daily work I'm assisting to the uh, special planning cooperation within the Vasov countries that are uh, located around the Baltic Sea. And if I may put in the words, uh, the picture you see in front of you that uh, the Baltic Sea is in our hearts and also in everything we do in our everyday, everyday work. So please, next slide. 
So what is WhatsApp actually? WhatsApp is an acronym stands for Vision and Strategies around the Baltic Sea, and it is also uh, known as Intergovernmental Cooperation among Ministries on Spatial Planning and Development. And its mission is to provide uh, territorial policy uh, policy measures for territorial development for the region, and also to ensure uh, the platform for knowledge exchange. Uh, the WhatsApp was established in the beginning of the 90s. It is guided by ministers and steered by WhatsApp committee, which is uh, composed of the senior office officials uh, for, at the national ministerial level. And uh, the first vision uh, WhatsApp uh, sketched already in the middle of the 90s. In that time, it indicated the territorial structure and also the values of the region. And that time, uh, the main focus was paid to the uh, in, uh, establishing the spatial integration within the region and also to uh, identify the common uh, uh, like identity of the region at that time. Please, next slide. And also, the, uh, like let's say, the first discussions about the need to have a maritime spatial planning or to extend the terrestrial planning towards offshore uh, were raised uh, within WhatsApp community already around the millennium. And so in a result in 2009, uh, WhatsApp ministers adopted its uh, long-term perspective for the territorial development of the Baltic Sea region 2030. And at that time, the maritime spatial planning, also the sustainable uh, maritime management was given more prominent role among other uh, so-called more classical uh, spatial planning topicalities. So please, next slide. And since then, uh, the WASAP has worked quite deliberately uh, towards the MSP. And in this regard, uh, it has also established, uh, I should say, great and successful collaboration with HELCOM within so-called HELCOM WASAP MSP working group, which ensures the cooperation between Baltic Sea countries for coherent MSP uh, processes in the region. HELCOM uh, is also known as Helsinki Commission and also is uh, the main governing body uh, for the Convention of Marine Environmental Protection of the Baltic Sea Area. And within this HELCOM lots of co collaboration, there have been um, elaborated and also agreed uh, 10 uh, MSP planning principles already in 2010. And uh, recently we evaluated those principles and they were regarded as still valid and also very important even today. And those principles cover such areas as sustainability, ecosystem-based approach, transparency, transboundary cooperation, coherence, and, and others. Uh, the macro-regional cooperation is on MSP is guided by MSP roadmap. It's our mid-term uh, document, and this document includes the overall goal, objectives, and also specific actions to be implemented. And HELCOM WhatsApp MSP Working Group also have elaborated several guidelines in order to support our maritime spatial planners in their work. And specifically, those guidelines are targeting on how to, for example, ensure the openness and transparency in maritime spatial planning in transboundary setting, how to apply ecosystem-based approach in maritime spatial planning, and also how to structure the MSP data in, to ensure that data is understandable and available, and also to ensure the overall coherence of maritime spatial plans. Uh, so uh, to conclude my part of our joint presentation today, I, I can say that the uh, Baltic Sea region is uh, you know, showing quite notable progress if you compare it 10 years ago. Uh, when there had only few examples of maritime spatial planning, then today uh, I can say that nearly all BSR countries are engaged uh, in MSP development processes at various stages, though, but still. And this is also with the fact that, uh, similarly at, as it is with Atlantic area, also in Baltic Sea region, not all countries are the members of the EU and therefore not entitled for the MSP directive. And however, the countries are being very active those years, uh, trying to fulfill the tasks both set in the directive, also in our regional uh, roadmap. 
and also being very active in uh, several projects, uh, trying to explore the new ways how to ensure the coherence of the maritime special plans. And even today, when I can say that most of the BSR countries will have their plans adopted sooner or later, uh, still the countries have expressed their willingness to continue this collaboration also after the adoption of their plans and also to, uh, to you know, join the forces for the joint work and try to find the more ways how to ensure the coherence of MSP. So I will now stop here and I will hand over to Maria. Uh, she is WASAP's commissioned expert from Special Foresight and she, together with her colleagues from Special Foresight and Nordregio, are helping us to uh, update our main strategic document called WASAP Long-Term Perspective. Okay, Maria. Thank you, Elina. Thank you, Karen, also for the introduction and uh, the organizers for the invitation today and hello everyone. Um, so let's talk about the future now and our process journey as I like to call it towards the update of the VASA long term perspective for uh, 2040. Uh, we have started with our work and which will continue until the end of 2022 on developing jointly together with VASA a shared vision for the Baltic Sea region for 2040. Uh, a vision that shares the characteristics of the region, the complexities, the land sea interactions, the challenges, as well as the cooperation frameworks uh, that exist in the region, and of course, all its places and people. And in this vision, as Elina already mentioned earlier, the sea plays, of course, an important role. We actually talk about the Baltic Sea region. Um, so question is, why do we need yet another vision? Uh, well, as you have also seen from Elina's slides already, over the years, VASA uh, has been quite forward-looking, and the proof for that is not only the development of such a document of a long-term perspective, but also the update of this living document uh, throughout the time and for different time horizons. So our work now is to update this long-term perspective for a new time horizon, namely 2040. And why so? Uh, well, actually, although many of the themes and the categories already addressed in the existing documents have proven rather contemporary over time, uh, we cannot neglect trends and changes and challenges that come up and are more recent, let alone all this pandemic reality and changes around that, when, especially when we think about the future. So we cannot neglect looking at the future with a fresh eye, so to say, and taking into account all these new developments. Um, in addition, we have also seen in different studies uh, the future of territorial development in the Baltic Sea region. We have also seen developments as regards the sea as such. So in our endeavor here, we will try to look at the integrated picture of these two and try to look into the land sea interactions I also mentioned in the beginning, so we're interested in this more integrated uh, picture, bringing this together. So a lot of the topics and trends that we look at try to reflect this aspect too. Uh, having said that, let's move to the next slide, please, and embark uh, a little bit in our process journey. So we have for this journey mainly four stops, and this combined largely uh, a thorough desk research and analysis as shown in the beginning of this figure as well as uh, a well-developed co-creation process. So first, we actually need to see what is out there, what policies may influence the vision, what are future plans that exist in the region, any trends that play out uh, to build the, the future. Uh, but most importantly, there is a continuous participatory and co-creation process throughout um, our update uh, from its very beginning to the very end. And that's the key element of the process. So during this co-creation process, uh, we together with FASAP developed this vision step by step. So developing also together the implementation framework, which would be the third stop in that journey. Uh, and of course, as a last step comes the dissemination of the work and spreading the word to the, to the world uh, about the process and the outcomes. So both internally in the region, in the countries, in line ministries or authorities, but also in other transnational areas and levels. So 
Besides our involvement in outreach activities and events, we also plan in our process to have some workshops for wider participation to involve other players and keep them up to date. Uh, so we still have a long way until the end of the journey. So in the last slide, uh, you may also find our contact details, uh, both of Elina's and mine. So if you have any questions or if you're interested in following this process, uh, please do not hesitate to contact us at the contact details you see. So thank you very much again for your attention and back to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Maria, and thanks to you earlier as well, Elena. We just have a couple of minutes for questions. I don't see any in the Q&A box yet, but maybe first, if I can put one to you, Elena, what is the best success story of the VASAB cooperation? Uh, thank you, Karen. Yes, indeed, uh, VASAB is here already for three decades, and uh, yeah, we can look back and see what has worked in which, but so. And, and I should also mention that uh, the Baltic Sea itself is a quite closed area with brackish waters and very vulnerable ecosystems. So by default, it requires uh, some special attention of uh, the joint decision. And also I should say that the uh, WASAB and especially HELCOM has been established long before the MSP came into the agenda. And also the European Union, when the VASA was established, was not so significantly represented in the region as it is today. And therefore, I think that like the best success could be, uh, as I may say, uh, it would be that thanks to our long cooperation tradition that we have in the Baltic Sea region, it has helped us uh, to, to, yeah, to set the Baltic Sea region as a forerunner and also maybe sometimes also as an example at the European level in MSP. And here, I mean, not only by having plans in a, not every, but most of the countries sooner or later, but also being able to agree on common work and also common working principles and general approaches. And uh, what additional bonus to that, I would say that also this long-term cooperation has helped us to engage uh, non-European countries as well, uh, because out of nine countries that are having the coastal line with the Baltic Sea, the Russia is not a member of the EU and therefore not entitled for the EU legislation and MSP directive. But however, Russia has been a very active member of the Health and Master Working Group, and they have even managed to have uh, initiate some activities towards establishing MSP frameworks also in their country. Okay, Elena, thank you for that. There's actually a question specifically for you coming in, Maria, from Cristina Cervera Nunes. I hope you're, I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Cristina. Um, Cristina wants to know from you, Maria, when you talk about participatory process in your process journey, what is the kind of stakeholder involvement, mm -hmm. administration, sectors, general public? Yes, so here we have, let's say, um, a two level of co-creation process. One is that we work very closely with VASAP to develop this uh, vision. And this is actually the VASAP Secretariat and the VASAP Committee on Spatial Planning and Development. So it's more the players that are directly involved with the update of the vision. Uh, but we also envisage a more wider participation to include uh, interested players from the Baltic Sea region, from the national level, from regional level, transnational. So it's one is more focused on the update with the players that are directly involved. And one, sorry for this, and one is a, a more wider uh, approach. Okay, well, look, we leave it there because we've run out of time. But Maria and Alina, thank you both for your excellent presentations and for answering the questions as well. You can shut your cameras off now because okay. we're coming to our second and, and actually the last uh, presentation as such. And this segment is on shared principles for MSP in the European Atlantic region. And our presenter for this segment will be Adriano Cantella. Adriano is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Environmental and Marine Studies at the University of Aveiro. He is currently supporting the SimNarat and Sim Atlantic projects, as well as being involved in the strategic environmental assessment of the Portuguese MSP. Adriana, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for your introduction. Uh, so, uh, in this presentation, I will briefly uh, talk about uh, the work that has been uh, done in the uh, Sim Atlantic project that uh, aims to provide a, 
an Atlantic region for MSP. But before I do that, I would like to take the time first to thank uh, MSP platform for the organizing of this event and to say that uh, as a researcher and uh, as a researcher, uh, MSP platform since the beginning of its existence has been a, an important form of discussion uh, in the scientific community uh, in the MSP uh, related subjects. Uh, Saying that, uh, uh, having that said, I, uh, I would like to take the opportunity also to talk to you about the momentum and uh, why now, why now an Atlantic vision for MSP and why uh, Sim Atlantic? Why now? Basically, as you, we could see in the, the first session, there's a lot of uh, things going on in the Atlantic uh, Sea Basin in terms of MSP, a lot of uh, plans have, uh, are being uh, implemented. And therefore, there is a, a common sense, a common perception of the need for an harmonization and uh, an articulation between these, these plans. That is why uh, the idea of uh, establishing a common vision and shared vision for MSP uh, is so important because it's the first step for this uh, harmonization. And why Sim Atlantic? Well, Sim Atlantic uh, was funded uh, in the right time because it was in the, the time where uh, the, the countries uh, were uh, supposed to deliver their MSP. So uh, in, in terms of timing, it was the, the perfect uh, uh, place for, for develop this, this, uh, this vision. So next slide, please. Basically, the aim of the, the Sim Atlantic is to, to produ produce a, 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 well, a first uh, approach in terms of, of vision that would take uh, uh, into account the common objectives and how this can be achieved in terms of the structures and mechanisms, uh, including the stakeholders' involvement. Uh, and also with identifying key uh, key points for a continued and sustainable uh, cross-border cooperation on MSP. Uh, the Atlantic vision for MSP uh, that will that will come in the form of a roadmap outlining uh, the, the the common Atlantic objectives, the structures, and detailing how this can be monitored and evaluated over time should be given uh, the local and national specificity, specificities of the regions. Uh, an Atlantic Maritime Special Plan is not only uh, appropriate, but, common, uh, but a common vision that could help to ensure the policy coherence in the region uh, would, would be very significant. So next slide, please. So uh, this slide is just to, to show you how uh, the, the project was uh, designed. So all the design of the project was, was done in order to, to, to have uh, the final document with the Atlantic region. So we have four, four case studies that would feed uh, four uh, cross-cutting themes. These are the governance, the data use and sharing, cumulative effects with cross-border strategic environmental assessment and the land-sea interactions. So this all four uh, cross-cutting themes are supposed to feed the, the, the document that will be the, the, the cherry on top of the cake, if, if you can say, say that, of the project. So next slide, please. So basically, we have some, some important deliverables of the project that uh, we consider very important in, uh, to, cons to, to build this, this vision. This is the implementation of uh, MSP in the Atlantic countries. This is uh, like an initial assessment of the situation of MSP. We, we have a, a, a deliverable of the current and future uses and needs for the Atlantic region through the identification of the current spatial uses and needs and also the potential uses and needs and the potential benefits uh, of MSP. Uh, this document will suggest uh, how to improve the integration of different human activities at sea within the Atlantic Sea Basin. And also we have an important uh, uh, deliverable uh, 
work package, if you can say, uh, that will that is very important to build a vision that is governance on how uh, European legal objectives could be incorporated in, in the MSP process. Uh, the MSP governance structures available at the transboundary level and the 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 build the 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 building of an Atlantic MSP cooperation group. Next slide, please. So basically, uh, our approach to, 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 the, to the construction of this vision is basically to, to see the literature. And we have a, a very important document produced by MSP platform that show us uh, the way to, to, to build visions for MSP. This is a very important document. Uh, we, we need to, to analyze the documents in terms of uh, sea based and regional policies and strategies that uh, have visions. And we also have to analyze uh, the country's strategies and visions, not only for MSP, but also for uh, the, the marine, marine Strategy Framework Directive. National, uh, next slide, please. So we have three levels of analysis. Basically, we have the, the national level through the, the visions that are uh, contained in the national strategies and the nas uh, national regions for MSP. We have uh, the regional level. And for this, we have two important uh, document structures, which are uh, the Atlantic Strategy strategy action plan 2.0 that deals deals more with uh, the component of uh, economic economic development of the maritime activities and the ospar uh, northeast atlantic environmental strategy 2020 2013 that deals more with the with the component of the environment of the atlantic and then we have the project level with the contributions of the cross cutting teams that i as i said before so next slide, please. So uh, in relation to the Atlantic Strategy uh, Action Plan, I won't go much into detail on how uh, the, the action plan would, would contribute to the, 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 the vision because, uh, and I thank Frederick for doing that for me because it was very brilliantly explained in her, his presentation. But to, to say that the action plan goes a little bit behind the theme of maritime special planning, this was more true in the previous cycle of the, the action plan. And I, I, uh, I, I'm glad to see that in the second cycle, the maritime special planning is uh, taking more into account. And this is a, a very positive point. Uh, the action plan uh, should place uh, emphasis on the importance of maritime special planning and for the development of the blue economy in particular regarding the pillars one, two, and four. Not that the, the, the ocean, uh, this means the, the ports, the, the renewable energies, and uh, the resilience of the oceans and uh, the coasts. Uh, not that uh, the ocean literacy is not important, but to say that the, those, those pillars are the ones that are more related with the, the project itself, the Sim Atlantic project. Uh, then, in terms of interna international partnerships, the Atlantic Basin has several uh, shores, as you know, and uh, the ocean has no borders. And while it is understood that the development of the uh, blue economy uh, aims to promote projects in the maritime area under the, the sovereignty of the EU, the action plan should draw the broader, the broad guidelines for partnerships in trans transatlantic context. And then, uh, in relation to OSPAR, uh, it, it is known and this is evident that OSPAR vision lacks the, the blue, uh, blue growth concept that the, 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 the transboundary need for an MSP, uh, the, the transboundary MSP, and the need for this, this approach. Next slide, please. Uh, but of course, OSPAR has four, strategic, four important strategic objectives that if we want to have a vision, uh, 
for the Atlantic, we need to incorporate. These are the, to achieve clean seas, to achieve biological diverse seas and healthy, healthy uh, seas, and to achieve productive and sustainable use seas, to achieve seas resilient to impacts of climate change and ocean acidification. Next slide, please. So uh, this slide, this is my last slide. I will go through the the, the result of uh, uh, desk analysis that uh, we have made through the national uh, documents that uh, contains the vision for the the, the, the ocean. So the, the, those those principles are the ones that we 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 found that are common to all. Uh, and of course, there are others that are specific to some countries that we also need to, to have in consideration, but I, I won't go through this. So basically, uh, the, the principle of providing a strategic environment, uh, strategic uh, integrated and uh, that looks forward uh, in terms of framework for all uses of the sea that to, will take into account the economic, the social and environmental objectives and this way to help to, to achieve sustainable development. Then to apply the ecosystem approach to the regulation and management to, in order to develop uh, to the development of activities in the marine environment by uh, safeguarding ecological processes and ecosystem resilience. Uh, this way, ensuring the environmental that the environment retains the capacity to deliver ecosystem services, and this way to support social and, and economic benefits. Then, to provide the uh, ways and means to articulate policies and activities that affect the marine marine areas, and to improve integration between those policies and activities to achieve multiple and shared objectives. And here we are talking about the objectives of the the, the, the sector the sectorial objectives. Then to enable uh, efficient decision making uh, offering benefits to marine managers and planners, uh, regulators, developers, users, and advisors, to provide a framework that can identify, preserve, and when appropriate, that recovers important components of coastal and marine ecosystems. And this includes species, habitats, physical features, natural processes, and natural heritage. Then to, to extend to all marine uh, waters within the relevant jurisdiction. Uh, here we talk about uh, economic exclusive zones or equivalents and all the, the, the relevant ju ju jurisdiction. Uh, then to contain uh, a hierarchy of spatial scales that uh, uh, comprise a minimum, as a minimum, national, subnational levels. Uh, to create a more efficient and ra uh, rational use of marine space in order to provide a balanced view between competing uses and that that highlight where uh, human activities might uh, pre pre preclude another uh, by helping to avoid or minimize conflicts of interests, interests uh, optimizing co-location of compatible activities. Then to enable a better understanding of how cumulative effects of different types of human activities, both on uh, marine uh, ecosystem and uh, each and each other, and to understand how these uh, cumulative effects uh, operate and how they, 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 they work, to promote uh, the participation of stakeholders by being transparent, open, and inclusive, and also ensuring involvement of all real relevant stakeholders, including marine, marine users and local communities. And uh, finally, yeah, not finally, sorry, uh, facilitate coordination with, uh, with, the, with and between uh, governance tools and measures, such as land use planning, watershed management, and marine protected areas, and this way to contribute to, to the integrated coastal zone management. Then uh, this should be uh, 
the, the, the MSP should be based on the best available information and evidence, uh, including local knowledge. Where the information is lacking, decisions should be guided in a way that principles are on which MSP is based should include the precautionary principle uh, until such time as relevant information becomes available. And last, uh, to provide a strategic and efficient uh, and thereby uh, cost-effective uh, approach to information uh, that gathers collation, management, and access, reducing the burden and duplication of efforts between individual sectors and encouraging encouraging greater data availability uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that exists at the moment. So these are the principles that we found uh, common to all the, the, the national visions. And those are the, vision, the, the principles that uh, the vision for, uh, for, the, entire, for the, the Atlantic uh, should consider and incorporate. So if you, if you compare this, uh, uh, if you compare these uh, principles to the, the cross-cutting themes that we have in the project, you can see that uh, they are uh, more direct or more in, in their, indirectly uh, present in the cross-cutting themes. So uh, it's uh, it's uh, well, it's 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 a good it's good because we we built we built the project in a, in a good way. In terms, that's what I mean. So uh, this is uh, what I have for for today, and uh, looking forward for your questions. Back to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Adriano. Very comprehensive presentation. Thank you so much for that. Now we, um, I'm conscious that we're running out of time, so I'll just put one or two questions that have come in from our attendees. First, this one for you, Adriana, from Joseph and Song. Joseph, thanks for your question. How will the project ensure political commitment for adopting or adapting these visions? Which institutions are you considering to lead on these transboundary MSP visions, considering that historically, OSPAR's area of work and activity are focused on MSFD? Yeah, that's a really good question because it's one of the main threats of the, of the, of the vision, at least in my opinion. Is that the, is the follow-up? So, uh, in order to have an effective and uh, official vision, we need to we need to put it into discussion at the political level. That's for sure. And despite the fact that in the project we have national authorities for MSP in the in the Steam Atlantic countries, uh, there is a need. In fact, to 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 bring this uh, to the to the next level and bring it to this discussion at higher level. So I I was thinking that the, the proper forum to have this discussion and to to, to have this uh, uh, engagement, if you can say, it's probably the the European Union uh, expert group for MSP. But uh, this is something I haven't thought about. And I'm just wondering, um, Alan Quintrick had a question earlier, which we, which we were saying should suit for the third session. Can you answer this one, Adriana? Morning, sure. everybody. How um, how are national plans and the how can national plans and the Atlantic Action Plan be connected? Can you answer that one? Well, at the first stage, through through the region. Uh, I think that it's important that uh, we see the differences and the, the commonalities between the plans and to see the, the share points. And this is how we can create uh, a vision. I, th I don't think that this is the case the, where we can have, like in the Baltic Sea, a, a plan for, for the entire sea basin. I don't think that in terms of characteristics of the area, this can be possible. But I think that uh, the discussion on, on the on the visions that we have for our own areas uh, can uh, overlap, and these points we should we should enforce the, the the need to work together. Okay, 
Well, look, we leave it there. Mike Elliott has another question for you. So maybe you can answer that um, when you finish, Adriana, because we are now pushing into overtime. But Adriano, thank you very much for that. You can yeah. shut down your video. Um, and uh, again, lots of very interesting issues raised by our presenters. Now, so before we, be, we come to our conclusions, I want to draw your attention again to a survey that you will have access to after this webinar. And please, for those of you attending online, if you want to fill out the survey, then can you remain connected until the host closes the session and then you will be directed to the dedicated survey, which is designed to get your ideas on the vision for the Atlantic. And to tell us more now about the survey, we're going to hear from Anne-Marie O'Hagan from the Mare Centre at University College Cork in Ireland. And Anne-Marie is the coordinator of the Sim Atlantic project. Good morning to you, Anne-Marie. Good morning, Karen, and thank you. And thank you to everyone taking the time to join us this morning. Um, it's nearly sunny in Cork, and I know it's afternoon for some of you, so I won't take long and I won't delay. As Adriano mentioned, the Atlantic vision is informed by the research and the project. That's part of the evidence base, and all that information will be available on the Sim Atlantic website. When the project is ended, the website will be subsumed into our own Marai website and possibly also made available through the EU MSP platform website. So that's just important for you to know. Um, I think in the discussions we've had this morning, it's important just, I suppose, to reiterate that Article 11 of the MSP directive requires coherent and coordinated marine plans across marine regions. And that was really driven um, our work in some Atlantic and our vision. So the vision will be informed not only by the research conducted, by also, but also by national and EU policies like the Atlantic strategy, like experiences from elsewhere in the Baltic that we heard about. But we also want your input and we feel that your input would really benefit that vision. So if you move on to the next slide, please. Um, we've designed a very, very short survey. There's only five questions. As Karen mentioned, you will be automatically redirected to this once the host finishes this webinar. But really, we want to know the sector or the interest you represent and how that sector or interest might benefit from a common Atlantic vision for MSP. The priorities or targets that you'd like to see represented in that vision and the measures that might be needed to implement the vision. And really, as I mentioned, the, the need for coherence and for coordination is a requirement of the directive. It's enabled by projects like Sim Atlantic, like the MSP platform and the Atlantic Assistance Mechanism, because they enable us to work with our transboundary neighbors. So that's all I want to say. I'm sorry we can't be together in person, but please do fill in the survey if you're under time pressure. The survey will also be available on the Sim Atlantic website. Thanks, Karen. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. So do uh, stay on afterwards for that survey. Thank you again, Anne-Marie. Now uh, we come to the conclusions part of uh, the webinar. And to draw some conclusions from the webinar and what's been said, I'd like to welcome now onto our virtual stage, Anya de Tant and David San Miguel Esteban. Both are policy advisors from Senia, the European Climate, Environment and Infrastructure Executive Agency. So, Anya, I think you may have uh, just been logging on. Can you turn on your video, please, and your microphone? Great, Anya. And David, are you there as well? If you can turn on your video and microphone too, and Anya will start and then she'll hand over to David. Ah, excellent. There we go. The joys of technology finally working. So Anya, over to you first, and then you can pass the baton on to David. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I uh, really enjoyed um, the different presentations, I thought it was a very, very rich uh, event and exchange. And maybe that's my first point. Uh, I think today is an important event, uh, not only because we are reflecting on the future of uh, an Atlantic uh, vision um, and how to do MSP in the Atlantic, but it's also a good example of what we can achieve when different um, people, different experts, different projects come together 
and there's really added value to putting together all this knowledge and experience. Um, now, I think what I've heard uh, throughout the different sessions is, um, well, there was a lot there, so it's a bit difficult to, to, to really bring a summary. But I would say um, when we think about MSP, there's really kind of tension between the need for uh, long-term stability and predictability and the need to adapt to a, an environment that is complex, that is uh, changing very quickly and where we really need uh, some adaptive management. So with MSP, we need to tackle this, this kind of uh, tension between stability and adaptive measures. Um, and doing MSP is, of course, a complex issue. We've learned about different uses, about potential interactions, about uh, the need to develop a strategic vision. We've also learned about the diversity in approaches, in the processes, in the progress made. And uh, some keywords I've heard uh, throughout the different uh, sessions were really on the need to harmonize, the need to cooperate, the need to collaborate, to consult, and to bring coherence in what we do, both on a national, subnational level as on a cross-border level, as on a, I would say, sea basin level. Now, from the European Commission side, uh, we have been supporting this whole process in uh, different ways. Since 2014, uh, we can say that the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund has been supporting uh, EMFF projects in a number of sea basins. Um, which allowed us, I think, to arrive at the point where we are today, where we have increasing knowledge, increasing connections, increasing networks, and increasing vision towards where we go, both on national as on uh, transnational or our sea basin levels. So, of course, we need to learn also from each other. And I think the example that we got from what is happening in, uh, in uh, the Baltic with the Helcom Vasap MSP working group is a good example, but also a good source of, of inspiration for uh, the Atlantic. And clearly MSP can be and will be an enabler to reach the different objectives of the different pillars that have been, um, that have been defined in uh, the Atlantic Action Plan uh, version 02. Um, uh, well, I've heard how this Atlantic Action Plan also aligns itself with the SDG development goals with the European Green Deal. So it once again shows how timely this meeting uh, and this exchange is. And when we talk or when we think of um, the European communication that was adopted yesterday on a sustainable blue economy, uh, which aligns with the Green Deal, there are, of course, two key matters. One is economic recovery, stimulating the blue economy, allowing to develop a blue economy for the future, but also allowing environmental protection, mitigating climate change. So there the two keywords are sustainability and resilience. And just to uh, conclude, I would say uh, what we hope to do and what we intend to do within the Commission uh, policy and with the support to projects under the new upcoming European Maritime Fisheries and Aquaculture Fund will be exactly this, to support innovation in the blue economy, support sustainability, support resilience, and two good examples of what is there in terms of supporting uh, structures is the Blue Investment Platform and the Blue Investment Fund. So I really invite all of you to keep an eye on what is upcoming, on the calls that we will launch. And for sure, there will be uh, a lot of uh, possibilities in there to further cooperate on MSP in the Atlantic and across the Atlantic. Um, well, I'm going to stop here and I pass the floor to my colleague, David. Thank you. 
So thank you, Karen, and thank you, Anya, for the wonderful um, uh, remarks. I just wanted to to maybe pick up from, um, and, and I know that we are running out of time because we are uh, behind the schedule. But just just very briefly, I mean, because there was one question that that you, Karen, you you raised to to the participants as is how you know the COVID nineteen has affected you know the implementation of all these actions, and I think that we have suffered a lot during the last year and but we have also to to look at uh, at the future and the positive aspects and the lessons learned and i think that one of the lessons learned is that if we go together we are stronger i remember there was one motion of a project in the in the baltic that it was if you want to to go quick go alone if you want to go uh, longer or last uh, go together and i think this is the basis of of, of these workshops today it was to put together different initiatives, Atlantic Action Plan, MSP Assistance Mechanism, and one uh, cross-border Atlantic project uh, working on MSP, put it together to start, you know, um, a kind of, uh, of collaboration. Um, as Anya was mentioned, uh, from CINEA, from Digimare, we would like to push more for these kind of synergies, of course, wherever are relevant. Uh, the idea is not to to, to to make things if they are not relevant. But I think that uh, recovery plans and resilience plans are going to bring, you know, funds uh, and funding opportunities. And then the challenge is going to, 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 to be how to, you know, convert and how to, you know, manage all these uh, possibilities and all these uh, projects that are going to materialize in the in the near future. With the MFAF, uh, Digimare, I mean, uh, intends to, to continue supporting maritime special planning, um, also in the, in the Atlantic. And I think that what is very important is that projects can also contribute not only to, you know, achieve their own results, uh, but also to contribute to uh, achieve the results of the policy. And that's at this at this point where I think that Sim Atlantic or MSP projects can contribute a lot with Atlantic Action Plan. We have seen, you know, the, the four different pillars or are relevant for MSP. I think that um, just one example, Marine Renewable Energies, they are going to be a, a boost or a deployment of, of marine renewal uh, offshore. But this is going to come with, with some conflicts. And I think that maritime special planning is a good tool, a relevant tool in order to, to, to try to avoid these conflicts and to try to yeah, uh, find solutions. So I think there is a lot of possibilities. We are going to continue pushing from here to put together all these initiatives because um, uh, one of the challenges is going to not to duplicate and to try to maximize you know uh, all the projects in order to to yeah get results so i leave it here because we are beyond the time but thank you very much uh, again to the msp assistance mechanism to organize this to sim atlantic and to the atlantic action plan it was wonderful to have uh, these three initiatives together and uh, thank you very much also, Karen, for the wonderful moderation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, David. And thanks to you earlier, Anya. So just before we go, on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to extend a big thanks to all of our panelists who presented during the webinar today. And of course, a big thanks to you to our attendees who uh, joined so many of you and stayed with us for most of the seminar. It's great to see so many of you still here at the end of it. A big thanks too to all the team from the various organizations who worked very hard behind the scenes to make today's event happen. We hope you've all found the session interesting and informative and that the organizers too, I'd like to say, would very much like to gather your thoughts and ideas on the future Atlantic vision for MSP. So please do stay connected until the session closes and you will be directed to the survey form, which Anne-Marie talked about a little bit earlier. So it was a pleasure to moderate today's webinar and I hope I see you again sometime in the future. I'm going to say goodbye now and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.